Hello, unstoppable real estate investors. I'm Rayana Starr, your hostess with the mostess, and I've got a very unique top five percenter guest for our show today. And I have to always get get going on Facebook and shut all these things down that put a glare on my glasses. Okay. So I've got Nathan Turner with us as my guest. Nathan lives up in Canada yeah. and he has a very unique real estate investment strategy that we're going to be sharing with you and talking about. But before we do that, this is coming live in my group, Unstoppable Real Estate Investor. Every Wednesday, I interview a top five percenter. What do I mean by that? The real estate investment industry, bigger pockets, and other statistics report that this is a very tough uh, profession to succeed in. 95% of all real estate investors fail. There's only 5% of us that actually make it as real estate investors. So I, am, I interview people that are thriving as real estate investors in my podcast on Wednesdays in my group at noon Eastern. And then on Fridays, I go the other extreme and I interview at noon on Fridays Eastern in my group, Unstoppable Real Estate Investor. I interview group members, clients, newer investors, and we're just talking about their journey and sharing how they're learning and what they're doing. So you get one extreme or the other. And if you're liking these podcasts, please feel free to join my group, The Unstoppable Real Estate Investor. I, I forgot to put the link up above, but I will, after we're done going live, I'll add it to the, to the top. If you're with us today live, let us know and say hello. And I'm just going to get into our group here so I can manage the chat. If any of you want to interact with us during this live, please feel free to. And we will, we would love the interaction and the love. Callie Haynes, right on. Sherwood Graham. Okay. Love it. Love having you. Please ask questions because we're going to talk about something very unique today. Nathan buys mortgage notes and that's how he invests in real estate. Now it's interesting because he lives in Canada and he only does this in the United States. But before we get into all that, Nathan, tell us a little bit, tell me a little bit about your background before you got into buying mortgage notes, got into real estate. Tell me a little bit about what you were doing and how you got into this. You bet. Hey, thanks so much for having me on. This is Yeah, so my this pleasure. Fun. This is good. So let's see, if we go back in time a little bit, if you remember the heyday of 2005, 2006, where uh, you could buy a house, sit on it for a couple of months and then sell it and make a profit. That's kind of what I did. I was, I was doing flipping properties back then um, I, in Canada at that time where I did do some renovations, but it was cosmetic. I didn't do anything heavy, uh, <laughs> but I was able to make money and it was, uh, it was good times. It was really fun. I and did that, that was 2005 uh, and six? Yeah, and 2007 right as crash. well. Yeah, okay. right before the crash. And then uh, I could kind of feel it coming. Something was going to change. And I ended up getting stuck with one property um, where it, it just wouldn't sell. All of a sudden, the market just came to a screeching halt. So it didn't sell. So I ended up renting it out. So that was my first foray as uh, a landlord. And as much as I really liked the cash flow, I hated being a landlord. It was just, it was so much work. It was on the other side of the country from me. So anytime the tenant moved out, it was actually more economical for me to get on a plane, go out and do whatever repairs, painting, whatever needed to wow, be done. Wow, what a pain. Oh, it was such a pain, but it, but it yeah. made sense economically and everything. And I'm like, well, I mean, my time, all that, but you know what? It made sense. So I, I went over there and, and did that. So I just, I didn't like being a landlord. Um, I, I've, I'd heard about that and I knew people who had done that. And I thought, why, <laughs> why are people being landlords? It's a lot of work. And it's, and it just, I didn't see the, the great reward out of that. Eventually we were able to sell that property when the market uh, turned back around and, and it all ended well, but, uh, but it, it introduced me to monthly cash flow. 
And like I said, that's the part I really liked. So fast forward a little bit, end of 2008, everything is just going haywire. And a friend of mine contacted me. He had, he's originally from Canada, had moved down to California. And some people that he had met uh, started talking about a bunch of properties that they had bought just before everything turned sour. And, and now they were stuck with them. It was mostly in the Midwest and they didn't know what to do with this stuff. None of them had even seen the houses, anything like that. It was just, it was not a good situation. So I uh, hired me and my, my friend to go and just do whatever we could. So we, being from Canada, seller financing is not something that's done. So we thought we kind of had invented seller financing and that's where you're selling properties on terms. And so we, we kind of thought we'd invented that. We thought we were pretty smart, but uh, of course it's, it's done all over the place. It's done. It's very common in the U S uh, but we didn't know that at the time. So as a result of that, we were doing it all wrong. Started doing some research, found somebody who talked about buying seller finance notes. And I went, oh, that's perfect. And he was offering a class all about that. And I'm like, that's what we do. We're doing seller finance. I didn't even know that was what it was called at the time, but that sounds like what we're doing. So when I took his class with the intention of still doing what I was doing, uh, buying a property, selling it on terms, and then to get out of it, I was going to sell them to this guy. Um, he didn't end up working out, but people that I had met through him did start to buy these. And I thought, this is great. We found out that what we had kind of stumbled into uh, was called notes. And we're like, oh, this is really cool. 2010 came along. All right, hold that, hold yeah. that thought, because I want you <laughs> yeah. to back up and break it down for some of the newer people so they get sure. it, because people can get lost in the financial stuff. But I want to say, Hey to Kelly Haynes, Sherwood Graham, Johnny Thunder, Shelly Heller. Cool. I'm glad you're here, Shell. Carl Lindback. And please just let us know you're here. And we're talking with Nathan Turner, and he has a very unique strategy as a real estate investor because there are a lot of ways to make money in real estate. Oh, yeah. If you don't want to grind with wholesaling and rehabbing, or you know, you're you're tentative about buying rental properties right now because of interest rates. There are a lot of ways to make money in real estate, tax liens. What we're talking about today is buying notes, seller, fan, seller financing, basically becoming the bank. And this is how Nathan acquires real estate investment properties. So Nathan, back us up. Like sure. Nathan's up in Canada and in Canada, they don't even do seller financing. So talk you know, he had a group of friends that had a bunch of properties they acquired right before the 2008 crash, and they were stuck with this portfolio. And they asked Nathan and a buddy of his to come in there, if you're just jumping on, I'm recapping, yeah. to come in and help them figure out what they could do. So start there and walk us through and explain in layman terms. Sure. Like, so an eighth grader could understand it you because this is unique. You're the first person I've interviewed who does, who acquires properties this way. Yeah. So, all right. Talk to us now about the whole situation. All right. So let's go back to seller financing for a second. So the way that that works, uh, like I said, I liked cash flow. That was great. I didn't like being a landlord. So how do you marry those two? and get the cash flow without being a landlord. Seller financing is the way to do it. Uh, there are different ways you can do that, and that's probably for a different call. <laughs> so is tell them what seller financing is. Even though it sounds obvious, yeah. explain exactly what it is, because that's different from subject to or novations. Right. So what exactly is seller financing for the newcomer? Right, so seller financing is where I own the property, and somebody wants to come in and move into the house, they can't get financing at a regular bank for whatever reason. They're self-employed, they don't have good credit, whatever, whatever the case might be. Um, so they come and they approach me and say, well, I'd, I love the house, I'd like to live in it. Uh, I even have money for a down payment, but the bank won't touch me. And I said, well, I'll give it a shot. You know, and, and I'll, of course, we look back in their history and make sure that they have the ability to make payments and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but then I'll set it up as if I was a bank. So I say, okay, I'm going to sell you this house. 
for a 10% down payment. Let's say the house is $100,000 sale price. So I'm going to take $10,000 down payment. And then the rest of that, the $90,000 balance, I'm going to set up as a note. So a monthly payments over time, same as you do. You're basically a, the mortgage lender. You're the yeah. bank now. And yeah. you're setting up the terms, what interest they're going to pay you, what right. the term is, like, is it 15 year or 30 year right. mortgage? Yeah, okay. exactly. So there's, there's, a, there's a bunch that goes into that. And like I said, that's probably a different phone call, but, uh, right. Right. but it's great. So when we're talking about just real quick, if we're talking about rising interest rates for a seller finance person, that's music to my ears. That's great. Uh, that means that if a bank is offering 7%, Nobody bats an eye if I'm offering 9% because um, they can't get the 7% of the bank, but I'll give them 9% all day. And uh, if that's the way that they can get into a property, that's, that's just fine. And it's not that much of a difference. When, when rates are at 3% and I'm offering 8 or 9%, they, they hesitate. Uh, but anyway, like I said, that's, a, that's maybe a bit. Yeah, you can, so what you're saying is you can, because it's kind of a subprime situation, someone can't get approved you're still offering them a good rate than a mortgage company would right. at two points above prime. So it's still a good deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, all right, continue with this strategy of, of buying <laughs> notes and how you're actually acquiring real estate investment properties doing it. You bet. So, um, so if you fast forward just a little bit, starting in 2010, somebody had approached me about buying non-performing notes. And my very first thought was, that's crazy. Why on earth would you buy a mortgage where the person's not making payments? And I thought, that's, that's nuts. That's insane. Why would you do that? Until I tried it. And then I went, oh, wow, this is fantastic. This is why. <laughs> <laughs> this is why. So essentially what that means is, let's say uh, a person back in that time, let's say they got a mortgage, uh, one of those zombie mortgages that you could get without even trying uh, in 2006 or seven. Um, they were not well qualified for that. So by the time 2010 rolled around, they're in serious trouble. So the bank is willing to sell that at a discount, uh, sell the loan as a discount. And the reason they do that is because to the bank, they're lenders. It's what they do. So if somebody stops paying on their mortgage, essentially that mortgage, the value of it drops to zero because there's, there's no value if somebody's not making payments. Um, they can go through and do the foreclosure and everything, but it's time consuming. It's not good for PR. It's, you know, they're not set up to own property at, at the back end of that. So, so it's not their preferred strategy. So banks will often will sell off, especially the non-performers, they'll sell off the non-performing loans to somebody else. Uh, oftentimes before that goes it goes into foreclosure and auction. Yeah, this is pre. So, are you going? Are you so? How are you getting into these deals? Are you going to banks and mortgage lenders, or are you going to sellers that are defaulted? I'm typically I'm going to hedge funds. Hedge okay. funds will do large trades with banks, uh, you know, hundred million dollar deals, and then I'll come in and I'll do a million dollar deal, and that's a that's much that's more palatable for me. I don't have the hundred million just yet, but we're working on that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I like your, your mindset there. <laughs> You're thinking they're, you big. Know, yeah, they're, they're not going to sell to me directly for a million bucks because it's not worth it for them. But they will sell the hedge fund and then I'll buy from the hedge fund. Roy Koppelman just joined us. Hi, Roy. Okay, keep going, Nathan. We're talking about buying notes and, and being, you know, and buying them from hedge funds and then being the mortgage lender yeah. and and then and so keep going and tell us how it is you you end up with these properties and what you do with them because you don't like being a landlord right but you right. like the passive income i do i like the passive income but being a landlord is the pits so um essentially that's it so i i started going to conferences i've found out there are conferences all about notes uh, i started going to conferences in 2009 and just meeting people and i've i've been doing that for years now and just it's all about networking it's all about who you're talking to and you know facetime face to face all that kind of stuff uh and over time uh, i've built up a really good network of these hedge fund managers who are willing to sell some of their loans off to somebody like me i'm not the only one that does this but 
but I do this uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well. And it's, yeah. And it's not a crowded market either. It's not, no, yeah. it's a pretty small group. Uh, we get together different conferences and it's always fun to see each other again. And it's the same people, you know, more or less, it's pretty much the same people. We all pretty much know each other. And how have you funded being able to buy these portfolios? I'm guessing you're buying more than one at a time. I it it varies. Sometimes I'm okay. just buying one or two at a time. Uh, okay. Right now, I am looking at a million dollar pool that I'm I'm purchasing, and it's it's a, a relatively small pool. It's eleven loans that I'm looking at. So eleven eleven of these loans that I'm looking at, purchase price is just over a million. Um, I hope to get that closed next week. We'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. But uh, but it's and how are money. you funding those? Where are you getting your money to buy those? Yeah, for that I'm using investors. So I started private and hard money. I uh, just private hard money, not so okay. much, but just yeah, private investors, people that I've net networked into, um, people looking for. Have you ever considered money. setting up like a consortium and? setting up your own hard money lender, you know, organization? Sort of. Things like that? I just set up a fund actually just last year. Okay. Um, and I'm actually raising capital for that right now and, and offering investors in return for that. So that's that's been kind of the latest development in my okay. journey is setting up this fund. But the, but going back to the original, um, you know, how do we how do we deal with this? So if I buy the mortgage on a property, again, I'm, I came from a real estate background like everybody else. So, so my initial goal was to get the property. As I've gone and the more experience that I've gotten, I don't want the property. All, I just want the paper behind the property. It's so much cleaner. It's so much easier. And, and I don't have the liability of a property. Uh, the flip side, of course, is that I don't have the appreciation, the long-term appreciation of the property. But... I don't have any of the headaches. So I don't have tenants. I don't have to worry about fixing a roof or a toilet or whatever. None of that's my problem. And I just get the, the, in, you know, the monthly cash. So are you selling these properties to invest real estate investors? Is that your market where you're selling them? No, or are these you are selling just... them to a retail buyer. So these are just uh, the people living in the houses. They're just regular Joe's anybody who has a mortgage. So it'll be like a mortgage that was originated by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo okay. then sold it off to a hedge fund and then I bought it from the hedge fund. And there might be so the people that were people the defaulted chain. on it are still sitting in the house. A lot of the time, not always. Okay. Sometimes they've moved on. Sometimes and, they've just vacated okay. the house. Okay, got it. In the and case then if that's vacated, okay. if it's just empty, then yeah. more often than not, my the way that I have to kind of get around that is I have to foreclose. So in that case, 99% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, I'm foreclosing on an empty property, not on a person, which is nice. I don't like to be that guy. Do you ever try to avoid that step by selling that property to a real estate investor and having them deal with that? Or do you have to go through that step because you own the note now? Well, that's the cool thing. So again, you okay. got to go back and say, okay, I'm the bank with the banker's hat. I don't own the property. So uh, I don't have the right to sell the, the house to anybody. I have to foreclose so that I can get title. Okay. And then, all right, so let's say you do that. Yeah. Then what? Uh, I usually, I will just try to, I'll put it up on the market. I, it's basically a wholesale okay. property. If somebody local wants to pick it up and do whatever they're going to do, fix it up, you know, okay, you know, whole whatever sale. you want to do, that's fine. So your strategy is you don't want to own any real estate assets and be a landlord. <laughs> nope. You're wanting to develop a passive income stream through right. a financial product rather than any yeah. hard real estate assets. Yeah. So if I do okay. take back a property and if I own a property, I'll own it for as short a period of time as I can. <laughs> I'll either okay. sell it, wholesale it back out, or I'll sell it with seller financing and create a new note and collect on that. Okay. So you're buying from hedge funds and mm -hmm. every now and then you have to foreclose on a property. So how have you built up your buyer's list to wholesale it? 
Uh, you know what? I, it's hardly even a buyer's list. I'm just, I just okay. put it up on the local market. I'll put it with the local realtor and that's it. Okay. So to give you an example, like before I ever buy any loan, um, there's, you know, all kinds of due diligence you do before that. One of those is I am, I am cognizant of the property because there is a chance that I'm going to take that property back. So I do some homework on the property itself. Part of that then is I send out a local real, realtor to go and give me their opinion of value and condition. And then uh, it, in case of, you know, and in case I need right. to close and take back a property. In that case, if I do take back a property, I've already got a realtor that has seen it, you know, six, eight months ago, that now I can call up and say, hey, you remember when I had you go and look at that property? I own it now, so let's let's get it listed ASAP. Okay. And even though you're listing it on the MLS, you're still willing to sell it at a wholesale price. Yeah, um, because that's that's the other part that we haven't really touched on is when I'm buying these mortgages, it's always at a discount. Uh, banks okay. are looking to just get rid of them. So they're willing to, to settle at a discount uh, and just cash out. Uh, so that, that so there's out. where big chunks of change come in for you is when you end up with a property even yeah. though you don't want it. So there's a stream of cash flow. Where is the main cash flow coming from? Is it the interest on the notes? Is that your main income in this strategy? Uh, it's it's the principal and interest. So it's just the okay. regular monthly payment. So it, right. and then in that case, that's we call that a performing note. So if I can, it, we talk about the foreclosure. The other side of that is if I can uh, talk to the person that's living in the house, let's say they have not vacated, they're still there. You know, 95% of the time, if I'm talking to them, we can work something out. If, if uh, you know- So you end up being a, a hero, not a villain. Exactly. I, I, it feels really Great good. Great if you can help do a lot that, isn't it? Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah. So they had, you know, a temporary job loss or something, some event, something happened in their life. Almost always they're back on their feet or they can figure something out. And they can start making payments again. And then I can go in and say, okay, so you were at a $800 payment. If that's no longer something you can do, could you do six? Could you do 600? And they say, yeah, that works. And so then we'll, we'll do a modification and make that official. And so then that's their new terms for their loan. So it's well, pretty great. But in order to cover, all right, so you bought that loan. Mm-hmm. And you get it at a discount. So I'm assuming that when you buy it from that hedge fund, yeah. especially if you buy in volume, yeah, how's that working for you? I mean, there's got to be a point where you can't negotiate any lower because it's not. Yeah, yeah, and for you, for sure. And this is where it comes into again coming from a real estate background. I think some people hear about notes and like, that sounds awesome. And it is, uh, but you can't just, you can't just step into it. There's, there's a lot to learn. You have to do your this research. Is not real estate. Yeah. This is not real yeah. estate. It's real estate related, but it's not necessarily real estate. So there's a lot of, you know, learning and things that you got to figure out before you just jump in. So that okay. would be my caution is, uh, okay, there's the first, caution. Some education. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the biggest challenge in this this particular strategy, you know, how long have you been at it? Like 10 2008. Years? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 14 years. Yeah. 14 years. So <clears throat> what would you say, like, where have been the landmines that you've stepped on? Like what, give us a couple of scenarios where you're like, Oh shit. You know, the challenges. So I think one of the first things, and this is, this is a big reason why I say I don't want the property. If the deal is going to go sideways, it's when I take back a property uh, because, because I'm buying a mortgage. So because I'm only looking at the mortgage, I don't have the right to go and enter that property. So there's some unknowns there, you know, what yeah, because like you don't it? own it. Right? right. So I'm just looking, I can get an idea of what the property's condition is by looking at the outside. And typically inside reflects outside and vice versa, but not always. And so we've had it where, you know, it looks decent enough on the outside and then we end up taking back a property. And, and like I say, it's usually a vacant house. So how long has it been vacant? And is it, you know, down in Louisiana where 
uh, humidity is, you know, 9,000% and all that kind of thing. And we get inside and it's all moldy and it's just oh, gross. not okay. 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 So, I, I mean, and again, it doesn't happen often, but if the deal is going to go sideways, that's when it happens is when we take it. Okay. So what's been your biggest challenge in this niche that you're in? Um, I think I've been around for a while. And so it's, it hasn't been a huge challenge for me, but I think for people getting started, one of the biggest things besides learning about how it all works is uh, finding product, like who's selling this stuff. And so that's, that's, I know. Getting plugged in with right hedge funds and, and sources to buy up the news. Yeah. So, and all I can say is network, 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 just talk to people. There are conferences. I actually bought a conference this year, one that's been running for the last seven years, and I just took it over this year uh, because oh, I, that you I believe so strongly. Conference that. and running. Yeah, yeah, but I, I that's awesome. I value conferences you. so much that I, I'm willing to put out the money to actually own it and uh, and put it on myself. How's the attendance on it? Uh, good. Before COVID, we were looking at anywhere between three and four hundred people. Um, this last one that we just had at the beginning of this year, just coming out of COVID was about 150. So it's definitely a drop off. Uh, I think next year's we'll have over 200. So we're, we'll have you there. ever considered a virtual model for it? Yeah. Yeah. A few of the different conferences went virtual during COVID. Um, it's okay, but it's, you know, it's not the same kind of thing. It's, it's still not the same because the thing about live events is just the networking. Yeah, exactly. The benefit of the networking and mm-hmm. building relationships so is there anything that we haven't covered or that i haven't asked you that you'd like to add in here right now like to tell people uh i think kind of the main things is is learn about it um and and i say that as not somebody who's selling a product to to teach you (laughs) i i'm it's it's not part of the business that i yeah, don't go to him to. because he's not interested in teaching you how to do this. Just, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Strategy. Right. Sure, and I'm more than happy to have conversation and, and do some, some question and answer and all that kind of thing. But uh, but if you're looking for courses, I've got some colleagues, some friends that are very good at it and that is their business. And I'm more than happy to refer you over to some people that can do a very good job. Okay. But but you need some kind of education. You need to understand that this is yeah. not real estate. You it's don't want to just jump into it, no. right? It, you know, we're talking about lending laws and, and collection laws and things like that. Like you could get into some serious trouble. So you, you really do need some, yeah. some education first. Yeah, because you're really not a real estate investor. You're more in financial services now. Yeah, yeah. people Speaking that have that, a finance background, they actually, this is an easy transition for them. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of that, Nanette Henry is one of one of my clients and she is in insurance and also okay. a real estate investor. Hey, Nanette. And hey, Wilbur Craig, nice seeing you again. So if you had a rooftop message that you could shout for the rooftops for everyone to hear and heed, what would it be with regarding buying notes? In notes specifically, um, I think it's just that there's another way, you know, I think everyone gets kind of pigeonholed into real estate investing and there's wholesaling, rehabbing and buying passive income rentals. And And, and those are all great. And then there's this, that's just kind of a different, uh, a different way of looking at the same kind of problem uh, and just approaching it from a different angle. And it's great. And, and if, even if all you do is just seller finance uh, instead of rentals, uh, that that would be a great first step. <laughs> Just get into that, uh, and then if you want to sell some of those performing um, seller finance deals that you've done, I buy those too. So you know, there's there are there are ways that you can pivot all over the place. So there, it's a it's a really fun business. Lots of different ways that you can approach it. So here's a guy that has figured out a little niche. Because he realized, Nathan realized he does not like being a landlord, but he saw something. It took him a few years to figure it out Mm -hmm. that there was still a way for him to acquire properties, which that's not really what he's interested in, but buying notes from a hedge fund and 
either doing seller financing and, and helping people that aren't going to qualify for a traditional loan. Right. And so when rates change, he's very happy because he knows he can go a couple points above prime if he wants to, and yeah. no one's going to give him a hard time. Yeah. So if you're interested, you know, there are a lot of ways. Nathan is a guest today because he's a, a great example of there are so many different ways you can make money in real estate and as an investor. If you are grinding away, trying to do the traditional ways that you've learned from some of these education companies and you are struggling, you're not getting deals because you're not marketing enough, you're not calling enough, you, you don't have the budget to pay for thousands of dollars a month for a marketing system and team, you're not wholesaling, rehabbing, buying rentals. There are other ways to make money in real estate, financial ways, like he buy, Nathan buys notes. You could be a private money lender. You, you know, there, mm -hmm. you could buy tax liens. There are so many ways you, you could buy land and develop yeah. it. There are so many ways to really make money in real estate. There, like, for example, short-term arbitrage. Yeah. People are doing Airbnb and they don't even own the property. They they have a rental lease with an with the option to sublet out. And it's a great strategy for you if you're new in real estate and you can't come up with a 20% down payment or whatever it is, or you, you know, the financing and stuff, a great way to start just to get some money coming in the door are some of these more creative strategies. Yeah. And none of them are things, nothing in real estate is a get rich quick. None of it. Right. You can really get into a lot of trouble trying to find the get rich quick. It's a whole new profession that you have to take time to learn and practice the skills. Nathan has said it more than once, several times in this podcast, how, look, there is a lot to learn. There's a lot of research. You really have to do your due diligence. So this is just one, one option for you. If you're curious about it, you can comment in the comments below and tag Nathan Turner so that he can respond to those comments. It's been a pleasure having you, Nathan. It's yeah, clear you. You're, you're, you know what you're doing. And you're passionate about it. Yeah. And I love that you found a solution that works best for you yeah. for not wanting to be a landlord and not wanting to do things the traditional way. You found another way. And this yeah. guy's doing all of this from Canada and everything he invests in is in the United States. Talk about overcoming obstacles. <laughs> There's just like, it's possible if you are willing to do the work and the research and take a risk and get in there and be creative. There's so many ways to make money in real estate. I want to thank you so much, Nathan, for being my guest. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up? I think that's it. Feel free to contact me. I'm I, like I say, I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you and uh, answer questions, whatever. Well, it's been such a pleasure and, and, and I hope we get to continue to get to know each other. And yeah, uh, I want to thank Patrick for introducing us, Patrick Yipez. Yeah. And um, yeah, so let's stay in touch. And if you're, you're curious about what Nathan's doing and it's something that appeals to you, just reach out to him and tag him in a, in a comment down below. Thank you so much, Nathan. I appreciate you. You bet. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.